Right, well, welcome back. We uh, have David Martin-Jones, who is the author of History's Fools. We've spoken with David Martin-Jones before. Um, welcome, David. Thank you for having me again. You're, I'm very pleased to have you back. So this is becoming a sort of book club. So we've spoken twice about your book, History's Fools, and uh, a, a separate book uh, by Mandelbaum. And now you and I, we're going to talk about Who Rules? Yeah. This is a new book. Uh, it's an edited volume by Roger Kimball of the New Criterion magazine. And uh, the subtitle here is Sovereignty, Nationalism, and the Fate of Freedom in the 21st Century. So this came out in, um, <clears throat> I think, October of 2020. You and I are speaking in January of 2021. Mm -hmm. um, and it was prescient because it's about uh, how progressivism particularly transnational progressivism has undermined democracy. And uh, it was um, particularly concerned about how political events in 2020 might actually make that worse. So actually um, push the, this is very American centric and, and the concern by the American authors is about how tran, uh, the, the more radical fringe of the democratic party would actually push a more radical transnational progressivism into the White House. So that's the, the era in which the book is written. Um, I'm going to just introduce the book by showing it, and then you can, you can tell us what you think. This is a very pithy book. So I've written a, re a review where I describe it as pithy. You can see it's an edited volume. It's got a lot of distinguished authors in it, but, it's, but they all write incredibly pithily and the chapters are short and, and to the point, and the book as a whole is, is uh, short for this genre. So I'm gonna tell you it's, it's 100 pages of main body text, that's it, 100 pages, but there's an awful lot of quality writing. It's very thoughtful. It made me realize an awful lot of stuff and it, it makes me, um, it helps me um, interpret current events. So that, for me, I've done, my first credit to this book is it's pithily well written, and I almost never say that about political science <laughs> these days. What do you think in general? Yeah, no, I, I thought it was um, uh, pithy, um, and actually, as you say, very insightful um, in, uh, in in a telling uh, analysis of how. Um, I mean, particularly um, evident was this um, awareness of how deeply progressivism, uh, as it, or liberal progressivism, or neoliberalism, as they, as some of the authors call it, has had such a pernicious effect on um, a traditional understanding of American democracy. Um, and I think a number of the authors make the point that this progressivist um, agenda is um, underanalyzed and it, its emergence is, is not very well understood um, by Americans themselves um, to the extent that, as, as a number of authors point out, the founding fathers um, uh, and you know, the authors of the Federalist Papers and people like John Quincy Adams all had an understanding that actually put America first, um, as uh, one of the authors points out. When, when Trump uh, says America first, he's merely repeating an understanding that actually permeated American foreign policy in, for the most part of the 19th century. Um, and the idea then that to say that is somehow um, fascist, um, hideously reactionary and antithetical to the teleological direction of world history that the progressivists endorse indicates how corrupted um, our understand or American understanding is of its um, democratic and foreign policy foundations. 
Yeah, so let's let's talk about what they mean by transnational progressivism, because um, as you point out, they use some of the authors, there are 10 authors in this book. Um, some of them use uh, global globalism as a term, a synonym, and also um, neoliberalism, as you mentioned. Now, you've written your own book, History's Fools, in which you criticize particularly what you call progressive liberalism. So um, do you think the authors are talking about the same thing that you've criticized? Yeah. Yeah, I think that, I mean, they put it in a distinctly, as you said, American context, but obviously, you know, the, the European view of this is not dissimilar. And I think, you know, what's um, quite disturbing, you said, you know, that the authors point to the, um, a radical democratic fringe as promoting this kind of transnational progressivism. But in fact, um, it's, it's actually quite mainstream as John Fonte, um, John Font, in his, um, you know, who, who did, you know, coined the term, uh, the brilliant term transnational progressivism, um, points out, you know, it's not um, just um, a fringe Corbynite uh, tendency in this progressivism. It's, it's deeply penetrated into major institutional practices, whether in the State Department, the UK Foreign Office, or, or the EU um, Commission. Um, so, and its understanding is, is as you know, uh, a number of the essayists point out, assumes that the world is moving in a, you know, a liberal progressive direction and that um, the, the central, well, one of the core features of the essays is the, uh, the desire of this progressive elite that no longer um, has a homeland, its homeland is global, they are global citizens, they are, you know, in, in the European terminology, they'd be cosmopolitan uh, uh, Democrats, um, their, their central agenda is obviously anti-state and, and primarily, as, as, the author, as, as Kimball points out in his introduction, and Fonte points out, and a number of the other authors obviously point out, is that it's an attack on sovereignty. Um, uh, as um, a number of people quote Robert Kagan of the Brookings Institute, um, arguing that, uh, that he welcomes a world of pooled and reduced sovereignty. Um, and it's interesting, you know, just re recently reading um, pieces on the horrors of Brexit in you know, organs of the transnationalist progressivist agenda like the Financial Times, Martin Wolf talking about the fetishism of sovereignty that Brexiteers have, and presumably similarly in, in the United States, the fetish of American sovereignty, which um, actually is not fetishistic without sovereignty you can't have a state, and without a state, you can't have a polis. And this seems to be the progressive agenda. It doesn't want the state. It, it's always been critical of the state since the third way kicked off in the, in the 1990s. And it wants this dissolution of the nations uh, of the world into some kind of uh, universality. Um, that is actually not um, being delivered in, in any coherent sense. In fact, um, all the agenda, the, the agenda that this progressivism has followed since the 1990s has led to the further, as um, Daniel McCarthy in the la last essay points out, the, the, the growing suicide of the West actually which this liberal progressivism seems to want to bring on in a Toynbean sense. So David, uh, so thank you. I think um, we, we've both got the book in hand. Yeah. Um, now you mentioned John Fonte. Actually, John Fonte's chapter comes as the fourth 
Yeah. Uh, the fourth chapter down, including the editor's introduction, I actually thought his should have been first because he launches into a, a really staggering revelation of what he calls the, um, the, the transnational progressive network. So and what he means is these academics and lawyers who are, pu who are pushing this agenda and, and they're feeding each other and they, they're actually, they actually are very pseudo academic in this. They, they're, it's a political agenda, which they are, they're hanging the baubles of academic credibility on this. But he exposes them. This is John Fonte's chapter. He really exposes them as, 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 as vacuous. They're they're they're, yeah. they're pushing an agenda which, um, which they can't define. So the concepts they they will criticize populism. Populism is never never defined. I've actually written about this myself. It's never defined, but it it's just a catch-all term for anything you don't like. Um, there's more to say about that. But he points out, um, you know, the Journal of Democracy is not a real academic journal it's just um it's a political advocacy and then there's this this vicious circle from our perspective where they're quoting each other so they'll say the journal of democracy says trump is a populist oh well okay so there's there's academic there's academic uh, foundations to our prejudice and then it's just the prejudice and an undefined prejudice spinning around so i thought his chapter was excellent at introducing that network and really the book should have started with that. Um, what did you think of John Fonte's chapter in particular? Well, yeah, I agree with you. I, I mean, I think the, uh, the identification of that, um, um, you know, burgeoning transnational progressivism using democracy in a way that's actually not democratic at all, you know, that uh, the national endowment for democracy was started in the, um, 40s, I think, by Eleanor Roosevelt as, as, as a democracy promoting um, uh, arrangement that was, um, you know, funded uh, and still is uh, by the American taxpayer to promote something like liberal democracy in um, self-governing states uh, during the 50s. And, and, and it, um, to some extent, well, it largely, you know, followed that um, uh, uh, direction until the 90s when we had this moment of the end of history that we've talked about and, and some of the authors talk about in, in this book that sort of allowed um, a new um, version of democracy which wanted not democracy itself but a kind of soft despotism as Kimball points out in his opening remarks on the book, um, quoting um, Tocqueville um, of what kind of tutorial re rearrangement will work for a mass that's um, you know, kind of looked after, um, but doesn't want anything but uh, superficial, um, you know, uh, uh, a superficial lifestyle to be led uh, in, you know, to be to govern, governed by a tutelary elite that keeps, keeps it in a position of permanent infantilism. Um, so this tutelary elite emerges, you know, as Fonte shows in the 1990s and uses democracy um, in, in its own self-serving image. It's, it's not about um, a liberal, classical liberal democratic arrangement as um, somebody like uh, Madison would have uh, understood it in the Federalist Papers, where um, a democracy is a framework, a container for diverse and pluralist opinions and groups sharing a public um, concern for the polis. Uh, the Journal of Democracy increasingly only sees one version of democracy, which is a form of elite democracy. Hence, it has increasing problems um, distinguishing between a one-party state like Singapore, an administrative state, and its understanding of you know, democracy elsewhere in the world. And you also have, you know, within this framework, um, other writers from uh, MIT and Harvard, like uh, 
Levitsky, Daniel Levitsky and uh, Way, um, arguing that actually, well, now uh, also alongside um, forms of democracy that are, um, well, you know, they, they have a, a, a kind of a liberal democratic procedure. Um, we can also add that, that there's a new form of um, electoral authoritarianism um, that um, fits into then re-describing anything that comes out of Europe or America that doesn't fulfill this elite um, direction of liberal um, internationalism as being itself authoritarian. So there's, there, there's a very limited vocabulary in, in um, uh, the Journal of Democracy that leads to a caricature of um, uh, Western political arrangements. And um, uh, Font does a very good job at, at exploring how that's evolved um, and how the Journal of Democracy is actually not about democracy, but, but about a pro progressive ideology yeah. And anything that doesn't fit within it is by that fact not democratic. So by a curious kind of um, uh, uh, a curious um, uh, set of evasions and equivocations, um, people who want democratic accountability are not seen as the demos. Um, in fact, they need to be guided. So what in fact um, the journal of democracy ends up with is a form of guided democracy. Yeah. But under a, a sort of liberal um, um, understanding um, which promotes diversity and, and difference as opposed to a completely um, nationalist agenda as in Singapore, which is actually, you know, if you're gonna have an administrative state as a number of these authors point out, America is developing in this kind of um, di diverse um, group society managed by a tutelary elite. Well, you'd be better off really with a Singapore model, which actually you know, um, allocates um, more effectively resources in order to promote um, a, um, a, a meritocratic elite um, than the American version that promotes on the basis of um, uh, oppression quotients, really. Yeah, so let's, let's clarify some of these terms. So um, John Fonte is talking about what he calls the democracy promotion network. So this is on page 23. Um, and, and there's an irony in that term because he's going on, this is at the beginning of the chapter, he goes on to tell us that the democracy promotion network, as you have just said, it's actually not promoting democracy, it's promoting the administrative state, so the unelected part of government, bigger and bigger, more, more unaccountable, and supranational institutions that remove democracy from the state or are not even democratic at all. So the Democracy Promotion Network is not promoting democracy, it's, it's actually anti-democratic, um, and it's not liberal either in the classical liberal. I think it's in the sense of classical liberalism, it's neoliberal, as I think most of these authors would would yeah. describe it. Um, I think it's fair to say that these authors are generally classical liberal. They believe in individual individual freedom, and that's captured by um, part of the subtitle, which is about the fate of freedom, the fate of freedom. Um, so. It, it, the Democracy Promotion Network actually ends up being anti-democratic and anti-liberal, and that can be seen in the fetish for regulation, unaccountable regulation by people who are not elected. And then the, the as you, you have also written about in History's Fools, the infringements of other people's rights in order to promote favored groups. So individual liberty, like free speech, is infringed in order to promote diversity and difference, or at least those diverse and different groups that are fashionable because fashionable, because not all groups are actually equally favored in, in the progressive system. Um, so the, the, yeah. the other feature of it, and um, you know, the, as you rightly say, the book is concerned with um, two things. One is the um, 
the dissolution of what had traditionally been understood as um, an American democratic uh, understanding going back to the 18th century and its concern with um, a, a Republican form of governance that promoted really a kind of, you know, what was central to it was a middle class that was affluent and growing and provided the basis for a middle way politically, you know, following an Aristotelian mean within a polis that was a, 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 a national container for a, a, a public, um, uh, for a shared public um, uh, political understanding, uh, at the same time allowing private diversity and difference. The, that was the classical understanding of the American democratic um, worldview. Um, it's been corrupted by a progressivism that no longer believes in that version of, of, of liberty being, um, as one of the essays say, uh, essayists argue, um, that uh, practice of liberty can only come about in, in, in a public domain. This was well understood by political theorists from Aristotle to Hannah Arendt, um, you know, uh, in our understandings, you know, when we did politics as an undergraduate in the 70s or 80s. Um, this understanding has now been replaced by a progressive view that sees democracy not as promoting liberty, but as promoting equality, and not merely equality of opportunity, but equality of outcome, and sees rights not as individual rights, but as group rights. And any group that is not um, statistically represented in proportion to its um, numbers in the polity must thereby be um, compensated for through this, um, uh, what, is, what is viewed as a social justice agenda. And not only is this applied to American um, institutions and um, uh, businesses, um, across, you know, within America. It's also a transnational agenda that has to equalize distributions across the globe, creating a uniformity um, of um, peoples, irrespective of um, their backgrounds, um, in order to, to enable a harmonious world order, a, a kind of utopia of liberal progressivism to emerge. So in the name of difference, it's trying to obviate difference and to bring back or, or, or to create a new utopianism that is post-state, post-national, and of course, post-modern as well. Yeah, so let's identify some of the authors that talk about that. So you can tell me who, who you thought was best on that. I actually thought David Azarad was best on talking about identity politics, um, you, you know, he, he for, to quote, um, he says, social justice, it turns out, always comes at the expense of certain core natural and civil rights, end quote, such as freedom of association, free speech, due process. Moreover, diversity, this is a quote, quote, diversity produces mind numbing conformity, conformity, as is readily apparent in our identitarian institutions of higher indoctrination. That's a euphemism for academia, yeah. in which you and I work. Um, so I thought he was great on identity very pithy, very beautifully written. Um, I'll, I'll credit also um, uh, James Pearson, who yes. also is very good on uh, the rise of the diversity agenda as part of the transnational progressivism. So transnational progressivisms wanted to break down borders and diversity was uh, uh, part of that agenda. And then the third chapter I'm going to bundle here in the people who are good on, um, on tackling the uh, diversity identity politics agenda is John O'Sullivan, whom you know, uh, he's very good at targeting multiculturalism, 
and uh, the Davis Hansen as well. Yeah, well, yes, yeah, so he's. I think Victor Davis Hansen is is better at targeting the um, the institutionalization of difference and the undermining of citizenship, particularly. And John O'Sullivan's really good at attacking multiculturalism as it, its hypocrisy is that uh, actually only certain cultures matter, and the culture that matters least is the national one. Yeah. So in order to be multicultural, uh, you have to undermine the nation state. And that means undermining what it means to be American in the context of these American authors. John O'Sullivan is born British, like you and I, but is a naturalized American citizen. So he was speaking as, a, as an immigrant to America in the 1970s. And his talks about his dismay at how multiculturalism, he could, he could see it even back then. It was, it was undermining American culture and thus, and thus was undermining social cohesion and everything that you've talked about in History is Full. So I think those three authors, John O'Sullivan, James Pearson, and David Azarad were really good for me in this book on, on those diversity, multiculturalism, and identity politics. None, none of those things are bad, none of them are wrong. It's just the application of them, the hypocritical and unfair application of them by transnational progressives. Um, but what did you think? Yeah, well, I mean, all those things. Uh, I mean, I think also the, um, uh, the, the point that O'Sullivan and um, uh, Pearson make is that um, America began as a union, a union of um, separate states that created the basis for a, uh, a United States. And it took, it was, um, over a period of, of uh, more than a century, that something like an American nation was forged, and it was forged out of a lot of um, um, you know difference of, of about a, you know the, basically out of the Civil War and two World Wars, and that there was a coherent sense of an American nation that was clear in the 1950s and 60s, but then you know. Um, that would became undermined as the politics of multiculturalism begins to take shape from the 70s and 80s as part of an, a liberal self critique that was always you know implicit in classical liberalism as um, some of the other authors like um, Daniel Daniel um, uh, Harpy points out um, you know, the, the liberal, the, even the classical liberal project was about, you know, de deconstructing its, um, a, it, its uh, understanding of the state and the, um, the, the demos, um, as, you know, a, a, a writer not referred to here, but was, did a, a you know, brilliant analysis of liberalism in the 1990s. He talked of the 19th century aristocratic liberals who were de Tocqueville and um, uh, von Humboldt and John Stuart Mill. And implicit in all of them is that they are scared of um, the people. You know, they fear the tyranny of the majority. Um, and the idea that any um, majority, uh, particularly uh, a conservative white majority, it is a threat was um, uh, a fear that aristocratic liberals had in the, the 19th century and has been replicated in, in the progressivism of the late 20th century, which wants to, as um, you know, the Azarad uh, essay brilliantly points out, deconstruct whiteness you know, as the, um, the consummating human stain, really. Yeah. So you mentioned um, several things that are brought up in other chapters. So you, you, you mentioned earlier the decline of the middle class, which is um, explored by Christopher Buzzkirk's chapter. Yeah. Again, it's just rich with data, very insightful in a short space of time. Um, it brilliantly analyzes how middle class opportunity has declined, the cost of living, uh, has gone up, the, the real incomes have not gone up, um, 
And there are transnational progressive reasons for that, such as increasing immigration, which drives costs up, um, drives wages down. Uh, then um, he, he, he adds to this sort of economic analysis, this cultural analysis or socio-cultural analysis, where he blames the, the decline in the family and also the, the decline in virtuous old fashioned American virtues such as thrift, as Margaret Thatcher would call it, and, um, and, and staying out of debt and not engaging in what Buzzkurt describes as socially damaging activities. So a lot of economic growth for Buzzkirk is based on socially damaging activities such as outsourcing childcare or um, consuming pornography as one of his issues in this chapter. Uh, so he's, it, it, he's making an argument that you very rarely see, I've seen it in your book, is that um, progressives champion economic growth at the expense of other things, or they, and, and moreover, they champion economic growth um, irrespective of what sort of growth. And Buzzkirk is making the point, a lot of economic growth is not virtuous economic growth as he would see it. So, so if, you, if you're consuming more pornography, you know, it's not a productive industry and it has so, socially negative consequences uh, for Buzzkirk. So it's an argument, um, it's very rarely seen and I've not seen it done as brilliantly as Buzzkirk does it in that little chapter. Uh, and then Daniel McCarthy, whom you mentioned earlier, he also echoes some of those concerns, such as low birth rate, uh, which Buzzkirk blames on the, the denigration of the family. Uh, and he also blames it on feminism. So feminism damages heterosexual relationships, and then that damages family stability, and that lowers the birth rate. And also the birth rate is incidentally lowered by increasing economic, uh, the cost of living. So people have to be, um, young people wait longer before they have families and that means they have fewer children. Um, so, so Daniel McCarthy, um, Christopher Buzzker, really brilliant on the economics. And that's actually not what I was expecting from this book. I thought it was gonna be political, but the way it ties in the economics and the cultural aspects of the socioeconomics is really brilliant. Um, what do you think about the, the economic arguments here? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that's, um, I think the other point that um, uh, McCarthy and uh, Christopher Buscott make is that um, uh, th this privileging of the economic, which um, was, uh, you know, goes back to the Reagan Thatcher era when libertarian economists um, made the market uh, a kind of a shibboleth. So, Actually, as um, I, I think, um, yeah, Buskirk points out uh, importantly, is, is that conservatives actually uh, only see the market useful if it's going to be um, productive of um, economic uh, welfare and support and, and growth for the family and um, the wider community. That, of the, the polis or the nation state. Uh, economic growth at, at, as a uh, as something to be maintained uh, irrespective of what impact it has on um, local communities as a kind of um, uh, ideological shibboleth as it, as it sort of became in the 80s and 90s so that whatever creates, uh, enhances GDP um, globally, it is necessarily a utility maximizing benefit for everyone, um, is a kind of Marxist understanding of, of, of economics, not a conservative one. And that aspect of, of liberal um, economics, um, um, always promotes um, growth or, or um, increased productivity, which if it's a matter of employing a, a nanny to look after your children because both parents have to go to work to afford their lifestyle and then you know, have to put off um, having children until they're 
thirties, it, it is not productive um, socially. It is productive, you know, in GDP terms, it might look good, but in actual human terms, it's um, less than optimal. And I think, you know, the um, a number of the, the writers point out that uh, the concern in progressivism with abstract conceptions like how does it advance the market or how does it improve democracy are abstract questions. It ignores the idea that was central to what was political thought, which is how do we promote the good life and the good life not of the globe, but of our citizenry, of our polis. And, and this understanding of the relationship between freedom of the individual, not of the group, of um, the integrity of the polis and its service, not of the globe, but of the state citizen is, is what um, a number of these authors are trying to recapture and what progressivism wants to destroy, really. Yeah, so I think you, you, you've raised two points that I think we should explore. The first one is the blame, the share of blame that conservatives themselves hold in the um, decline of individual freedom and national sovereignty. So I think uh, Daniel, uh, so, um, Christopher Buzzkirk is best at uh, uh, at skewering conservatives, conservatives for aligning, he, he describes them as aligning with progressives on neoliberalism. So the neoliberalism you're talking about, which is sort of Reagan, Thatcher economics, which is um, uh, uh, putting the markets, market forces ahead of social and communitarian uh, values or, or utilities. Um, so this is where these authors start to sound a lot like British social democrats who want to put uh, social and community objectives ahead of economic freedoms, or uh, at least um, as expressed through market forces without, um, without uh, higher, um, what, what would we call them? Um, they would be uh, uh, constraints, I think would be the fairest way of saying constraints on the market in order to prevent these negative outcomes such as um, uh, people being homeless through temporary breaks in their employment. So that, so that, that would be a, a form of social safety net, which I think everybody could agree with. Uh, so, so I think Buzzkirk is best at lampooning conservatives. So this is not a book that's just about progressivism as the as the failed ideology or the or the um, or the vicious ideology. Conservatives, in the form of neoliberalism at least, have contributed to transnational progressivism. I think Daniel McCarthy seconds Christopher Buzzkirk on this. And then the other issue you just brought up was citizenship. And I think Victor Davis Hanson is best at describing the, undermine, the progressive undermining of citizenship. Um, so so uh, first of all, can I ask you to talk about um, how, you, how you received the attack on conservatives here? And then we'll talk about um, Victor Davis Hanson's chapter. I think... Um... If I could, you know, just sort of uh, synthesize some of that. Um, the, um, the problem, I think, is McCarthy and, and Buskirk and, well, other authors, uh, Pearson as, as well, and, and John O'Sullivan. Um, part of the problem is that um, in the uh, Cold War, um, and it was still, you know, it was at the end of the Cold War that, you know, the, the major economic uh, success of the Western democracies exposed the failing incompetence of the Soviet um, model contributing to the ideology of the end of history. And a, a number of authors point out that in that period of the Cold War, 
conservatives and liberals were to some extent in a lie. Well, they were in alliance over the idea that the, the major enemy was this totalitarian alternative, um, all shared, um, a, you know, a, a, a sense that um, <clears throat> Western freedoms had to be protected by both conservatives who wanted a more traditionalist um, understanding of the state and society, a one nation understanding as Boris Johnson would reinterpret um, a post-Brexit Britain, um, along with liberals who weren't as, as aligned to the nation state, but saw it as a better, uh, a liberal democracy as a better form than a totalitarian version. That alliance broke down after 1990. And I think one of the problems is that um, conservative liberals or liberal conservatives embrace the market and, the, and market democracies were the ones that brought down communism during the Cold War. However, the, the then the um, explosive nature of um, capital development of financial markets, um, interneted um, financial flows, um, the stock exchanges that never sleep, and the ability given by the post-Cold War era to um, offshore manufacturing and production, which was um, incredibly good for the bottom line of any businesses, was not good for local communities in um, manufacturing areas, which saw their jobs shipped over to um, much cheaper, uh, less protected um, labor markets in Asia or um, um, Eastern Europe. So, um, the the liberal conservative, the libertarian conservative, who wanted um, uh, open markets um, in the and and still wanted open trading arrangements in the 1990s, um, rather problematically went along with the offshoring of, of industries that had such a catastrophic effect on blue collar communities across the West. And the legacy of that was the creation of, um, you know, the hillbilly elegy of James Vance or the precariat in, in, in the West that um, uh, like socialist writers like Standing have identified and, and the capitalism without capital that Steen Westlake um, identifies. And perhaps one area that, that, that could be attended to more in these essays is the role of the tech um, world, which is also completely progressive, liberal, and without any loyalty to its state basis. And one essay points out that, you know, Google will uh, uh, withdraw from contracts that have any link to the um, State Department, but will freely modify its policies when it's involved with China. Um, this kind of transnational hypocrisy by big tech um, is also part of the, the failings of this libertarian um, economic agenda, which was embraced by conservatives, but has now come back to haunt them in some ways, I think. Yeah, so I think it's David Azarad who makes that point about big tech. So you're right, the book is not not attacking big tech as much as I've seen other books, including yours, actually, History's Fools, um, makes, you, you make a lot of good points about uh, technology has added to the atomization of the, the individual and the, the decline of individ individual freedom or, or autonomy, autonomy to be more exact. And there isn't much of that in this book. Um, uh, there, there is criticism of how transnational progressives exploit big tech, but not so much uh, focus on how big tech contributes to, as a cause to the, um, to the, the collapse of sovereignty and individual freedom. But clearly it has, so, so, but big tech is part of globalization. It, 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 
it has contributed to the ease of communications across borders and to the offshoring of work and money and that contributes to the, the decline of national sovereignty. So you're right, this book isn't, isn't going to give you much on that. And in fact, probably people should read your book if they want to read more about big tech's contribution to this. Um, I think so we, the other point in the book that um, I think it's Buskirk points out, or, or McCarthy, is how um, um, fleeting the loyalties are of um, this, you know, kind of cosmopolitan class, whether it's in, in terms of big tech and its willingness to um, abandon principles it applies in, in the West to, to engage in uh, an authoritarian or a totalitarian market like that of Xi, Xi Jinping's China. And also the, the ability with, um, uh, you know, a, a sort of easy conscious, well, you know, a casuistry that you've got um, someone who was running cyber security for uh, Obama's White House, uh, having no problems taking a job with Huawei when it's on offer to reveal, you know, presumably uh, the cybersecurity networks that are designed to prevent Chinese access to American information. Um, yeah. th this kind of um, progressive hypocrisy uh, might have been, you know, even more brought out perhaps in, in the book than it, than it is. Yeah. So I think we should um, now move on to citizenship because this is a very strong argument and I'm not sure I've seen it articulated as well anywhere else. It starts with Victor Davis Hanson's chapter, which happens to be the first and the largest of the chapters in this book. And he's brilliant at, um, at deconstructing the uh, the assault, he, called, he characterizes, characterizes is, it as um, a progressive assault on citizenship. So he talks about pre-citizenship, so people can get all the rights of being an American citizen before they're even a citizen. Um, so residents are uh, treated with the same rights as citizens in his analysis. Then you get post-citizenship. So which which speaks more to what you're just talking about, which is people, the anywheres, as as uh, Hansen categorizes them, the anywheres, they want to live anywhere, they don't like borders and they don't like loyalties to any particular state. So that's sort of a post citizen. And it's really a brilliant chapter. Um, uh, yeah, so I, what what do we need to add about the the state of citizenship um, as articulated in this book? Well, yeah, well, the, um, the importance of, of Victor Davis Hanson's is that, um, or work, is that he shows very clearly that um, uh, the idea that um, uh, the primary understanding of American democracy was related to the idea of um, uh, a belonging to um, a, a polis or a nation state that, you know, reflected, you know, Victor Davis Hanson is a very kind of well credited um, historian of the ancient world. Um, and he knows how the uh, understanding of citizenship was central to a Greek and, and Roman understanding. Uh, of the uh, the, the kiwis and, and the kiwitas, um, and its um, translation to America under the you know the the, the founding fathers were deeply um, sort of immersed in 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 classics when they tried to well when they found their own version of a republic that looks to the past to move into the modern era and. Uh, what's happened, as, as um, Victor Davis Hanson argues, is multiculturalism is the first attempt or the initial attempt to undermine the basis of citizenship by affirmatively acting in favour of certain minorities and groups rather than pursuing an equal citizenship uh, understanding that was central um, to the classic or the, the, the founding fathers version of, of democracy, which was that you, you would have, you know, diversity of 
religion, creeds, um, uh, backgrounds, ethnicities, but you would share a, a public morality in pursuit of public happiness. Uh, multiculturalism was the first uh, ideology to undermine that sense of a shared citizenship and privilege certain groups affirmatively. And then it translated into this um, privileging of diversity, but only certain diversities. Other, you know, certain groups are um, treated as uh, necessarily um, um, uh, prosecutable for previous privilege, uh, even though that privilege seems um, rather obscure if you're you know, in a hillbilly community in Kentucky with living on opiates and uh, no job market. We, we should add that, that that punitive approach is illiberal because it violates the, um, the liberal principle that you don't punish the sons for the sins of their fathers. But David Azarad and others make the excellent point over and over again is that the new radical interpretation of identitarian politics is to um is to make all white people guilty for what white people some white people did in the past um, and at the same time as an aside david azarid makes this point too uh, without drawing attention to what non-white people do today so slavery is considered a peculiar activity by white people in the um, 18th and 17th centuries and not one that non-white people still engage in today. So slavery is still practiced in Africa and the Middle East um, and even in Europe. Um, we, we've had cases uh, of, of slave trafficking from continental Europe to even to Britain. So slavery still exists. Uh, it is not, um, it is not as reducible as progressives, radical pro progressives like to make out it is. Uh, so the, the interpretations of history and the interpretations of philosophy are themselves inherently illiberal. They're not liberal, they pretend to be liberal, but they are, they are not liberal. Well, they're also, um, I think, you know, one of the things that, that could have been uh, perhaps, you know, further explored in the book or in, of course they are you know short and pithy essays um is, is the fact that the identity well i mean a number of the authors point out that the identitarian agenda is is ut utopian it wants um it, it envisages a future place where we are homogenous um mm. even though it would seem that if you're white you'll, you still need further deconstructing um because uh, whiteness itself is a form of racism, apparently. You know? So, um, um, you know, the, the, the idea of, of, of whiteness is itself a racial, um, it's a form of racism. Um, but, you know, the, the, the whole uh, tenor of the uh, agenda of this um, progressivism is towards this uh, supposed multicultural harmony that will somehow uh, transform the globe and emancipate everyone in this end of history um, progressive moment. Um, but until we get there, you know, the struggle is continuous and um, the understanding of liberty is um, permanently under well, erasure, really. I mean, li liberty is not wanted as a, uh, an understanding of free individuals um, acting autonomously within a, a market that has a boundary around it, the state. Th this is um, uh, perniciously um, uh, inegalitarian and, and uh, has to be eroded and, and um, trashed. Um, so, so the, the, the understanding that's, that's, that's sort of, um, you know, very clear in the book is, is that progressivism is a utopian future agenda. And perhaps more could have been made of the fact that actually a conservative 
um, a conservative view looks to present laughter and a present condition. It's not just a traditionalist view. It doesn't, it's not a, a constructive nostalgia for the past. Um, it wants to use the past in the present um, in order to conduct um, one's relations without having to be permanently obsessing about whether your conduct uh, fulfills the right speech act criteria or whether it um, in some way unconsciously shows your um, white privilege. Yeah, I think we, you're, you're segueing now into what the authors expect from the future. And you reminded me most of John O'Sullivan, who's very good on articulating how progressivism, transnational progressivism, progressivism, this radical new form of it, it undermines itself. So it has to fail by its own terms, because um, as you've just articulated, I'm going to, you've articulated what, I'm going to introduce a new term for what you've just articulated, which is equity. So the Democratic Party has adopted this term equity. So rather than being even equitable, everybody has to have equity, which is um, really about a quality of outcomes rather than a quality of opportunity. And if white people have privilege, that's wrong. It's not, we're not going to allow for any meritorious privilege. Um, we have to bring white people down and assume that it's privileged by, by vicious, uh, as a product of vicious activities such as slavery. Um, so John O'Sullivan says this equity agenda is going to fail because and it's going to fail the people that supposedly progressives worry about most, which is the poor. So it makes the point transnational progressives, they worry about equity abroad too. So if they're going to improve the lot of people abroad, they're going to lower the standard of living for American poor in order to improve the lot of the poor abroad. Um, so, and, and a number of authors make this point, progressivism, undermines itself. Some are more confident than others. None of them think that progressivism is going to um, implode within years. Uh, and in fact, one of my criticisms of the book is that they don't address the future explicitly. In most cases, they're just, uh, they're very retrospective. They're looking at why we're in the state we're in rather than thinking about what happens next. But what did you think about that? What did you think about their um, their their criticism of where of or their expectation? Let's put it like this: as an expectation that progressivism will fail itself, will fail by its own terms. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. I mean, the the, the authors, as um, Kimball says in his introduction, are um, you know hopeful that you know, that, that progressivism, uh, because of its own internal contradictions that the essays, you know, expose in, in great detail, will fall of its own accord. But they're also somewhat gloomy about the prospects for a return to um, the nation state. Um, so one area that, um, you know, the, the, the area they see as, as necessary to bolster again, is the idea of um, uh, nationalism, that, that, that nationalism is um, kind of a, a way out of that. Um, but then, you know, the, I mean, I, I think, you know, John's article on, um, you know, uh, the nation state makes the important point that um, it's not a creedal nationalism that, that will work. It, it, it's a kind of loyalty to institutions um, that, that, that um, represent the nation state, understandings of um, the value of things like the rule of law and um, institutions that used to be accountable to the people as the demos that um, uh, are the people that share certain um, understandings of, of the um, an American culture, as, as Pearson puts it, um, um, that's their, um, I think, you know, hopeful way of, of moving forward. Um, 
However, you know, the, the, the problem with progressivism, even though it's internally contradictory and, and quite Orwellian in, in some of its, um, you know, corrective mechanisms at, at home, um, it, it's um, elites are so well entrenched in, you know, both business, the media, academe, and the and the governing classes, the administrative state, as a number of the authors call it, is so deeply entrenched now. It doesn't seem that it, it it's in in a process of internal collapse at the moment. Um, the the area in which it, it's probably most um, uh, noticeably exposed, as we will see with the um, evolution, perhaps of Biden's foreign policy is, is that um, in its promotion or return to promoting um, uh, a universalist uh, social justice agenda of human rights, um, post-national constellations like the European Union, it will find increasingly that a return to um, uh, an Obama or progressive policy of the period from well, late Clinton, well, from Clinton through to um, Obama uh, down to 2016, that that liberal progressivism is now a dead paradigm uh, and, and to return to it only exposes it further to the, um, the rise of revisionist powers that see liberalism as itself the weakness of the West that they can exploit. And indeed they can, um, you know, much is made of the fact that uh, Russia ha has a very clear idea of why um, the West is weak. And it's weak because it doesn't privilege, privilege its um, uh, national um, self-understanding. It's, it's liberalism it, it is a source of, um, uh, Russian soft war propaganda. It, 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 you know, Russia is quite keen to um, promote um, white rights supremacism because it would serve its um, own agenda. China similarly sees what it calls bizoism, liberalism, as uh, a weakness that can be um, used to undermine the West and. In a sense, it's, it's very obvious that this can be done because if the West is at the same time promoting, you know, its version of democracy, a la the journal of democracy, as some kind of more enlightened form of governance that everybody wants, and yet at the same time is involved in a deconstruction of itself, undermining itself, it seems a really messy project to export now in a way that it wasn't in the 1990s. So um, what's quite interesting is, is that its, um, its collapse will come uh, from those exploiting it externally rather than perhaps from internal mechanisms mm -hmm. because increasingly, you know, internal, um, the internal capacity for reasonable um, resistance or, um, uh, uh, sources of uh, debate and conversation are being um, uh, silenced. Yeah, I think you you make that point better in your book, Histories Falls, about how the how international relations are undermining Western liberalism. You make that point better than this particular book, and I think the reason for this is that these authors tend to be uh, focused on domestic politics. And you're more international, so they and and these authors are more focused on America in particular. It's very American centric. Um, so the, there's actually very little on the international undermining of the West. There's a lot about transnational undermining of the West, but these authors blame that on Western transnational progressives. So those people who want to um, take national sovereignty away and and give it to supranational institutions and undermine citizenship and other things. Um, so I suppose we can add that to 
our criticisms. This is not um, this is not a book that focuses on the international dimensions of these problems, but it is a very short book and and and, and it has a certain centrism to it. Yeah. Now, I think our final point uh, or subject, our final subject, David, should be prescriptions. So another criticism I had for this book is it, it really doesn't have many prescriptions. It's it's not it doesn't seem to set out to be prescriptive. It's so concerned with being descriptive about how we come to be in the uh, dire situation we are. There are very few explicit prescriptions. There are lots of implicit prescriptions. So when an author in this book says, um, "This is this is how." We came to be. This is this is one of the causes. Then you can find a prescription there by flipping that around. So, for instance, Buzz Kirk um, blames the destruction of quote family, religion, order, and belonging. So, and citizenship. So, there's a prescription there. What we need to do is promote family, religion, order, belonging, and citizenship. So, there are prescriptions implicit in here, but there are very few explicit prescriptions. And and as you say. The authors are generally pessimistic. Roger Kimball admits that in his introduction. He says, quote, the prognosis is, while not despairing, decidedly gloomy. And very few of the authors have anything to say about what we should do. Um, they just want that, you know, they would say very negative things. So John O'Sullivan says, quote, the American nation is under serious threat of dissolution. Dissolution. Um, the prescriptions, let me try to find some prescriptions. Uh, you know, Daniel McCarthy talks about creativity from conservatives. He wants, quote, creativity from, from conservatives, but he worries that doesn't come naturally. Um, uh, uh, the, the, the only couple of people who are uh, optimistic are only optimistic because they think progressivism will undermine itself. It will fail its own objective. So, so do you agree with me on that, on, um, on, a, on criticizing the prescriptions? Do you think it's sufficient, sufficiently implicit for us to take enough away? And what would you prescribe having read this book? Yeah, well, I, I think you're right. I mean, the conclusion is, I mean, if we think, think that the last chapter, you know, McCarthy's is the suicide yeah of the West. um that's right it, it, it would seem to indicate that the um you know that that were um uh you know that the situation is, is is not retrievable and um one one can sympathize with the pessimism you know that um uh you know part of the problem is that um you know a a, a liberal elite you know uh, i mean one of the points that pearson makes um in, in his chapter is that, um, you know, progressivism is, is not a recent foundation, you know, it goes back to the Wilson era after, you know, and, and, and the American uh, engagement uh, with the world as part of a, a liberal progressive, you know, um, understanding dates from, you know, 1918, 1919. Um, but just that, to clarify, just to clarify, David, that's a very different form of progressivism, as we we understand it. It was also as these authors understand it, right? So the progressivism of the early nineteenth century, so the Theodore Roosevelt progressivism, that's a lot about um, protecting society from abuses such as um, tainted foods or. Uh, uh, mergers and acquisitions, monopolies, right? So that's a progressive, uh, uh, what would we call an, uh, um, a founding form of progressivism, Theodore Roosevelt type progressivism. But these authors are criticizing transnational progressivism, which is, which is very different. It's, you, you could think about traditional progressivism as, as liberal. It's about protecting the individual from higher abuses, but, but they don't regard transnational progressivism as liberal. So, um, so there is, so in, in the implicit in that is some of these authors at least might be happy if, if progressivism restore, restored itself to its Theodore Roosevelt type roots and got rid of this radical uh, Marxist inspired 
wing. Yeah, but also I think, um, you know, as I think it's in Pearson's chapter, and again, it comes, I think, in one of the later chapters, it is that some aspect of this progressivism has been with us since the early 20th century, since particularly Woodrow Wilson, not Teddy Roosevelt, who, who was not in favor as, you know, Hamilton and, and Madison were, of getting involved in entangling alliances. Um, what has been, you know, if, if we, looked at American foreign policy from its foundation um, and its foundational doctrines with, you know, from Washington through to Madison and the Monroe Doctrine. It's about keeping America out of um, entangling alliances, especially in Europe, um, which um, would, would cease it retaining its capacity as a promised land. Um, it's only from Wilson onwards that America becomes involved in increasingly entangled alliances that give rise to this progressive um, uh, policy um, that becomes more and more apparent as we move through uh, the later 20th century from even from, uh, as one author points out, the Atlantic Charter, which requires the destruction of the British Empire is part of the initial version of a, a liberal progressive worldview that sees America as the, um, the uh, primary uh, power, the indispensable power in world politics. I, I think, uh, you know, a lot of the essays are pointing out that America ought to return to its more considered version of itself and, and maybe um, cease to play such a uh, positive role in, 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 in global alliances that don't really serve its interests. And um, what we're seeing now is a move back to, you know, more entangling alliances with talks of uh, um, a, a, an Asian NATO uh, being formed um, under American auspices to contain China. Well, um, it, America has to have a position on China now, obviously, and it needs to be very clear what that position is. But um, some of its uh, more entangling alliances going forward could prove, um, you know, highly counterproductive. What, one of the areas that is um, crucial um, from, from a Biden position is you know, it, it, it talks on one, one level about being uh, tough on China, on its genocide against the Uyghurs and other human rights abuses, yet it wants to work with China on areas of common interest like climate change. This sounds rather like going back to, um, you know, the, the Bush era and um, uh, even the Clinton era, when the job of America is to shape the emergence of China as a good international citizen. And we see, you know, one of the um, supposed founding fathers of realism, Henry Kissinger, whose um, position on China has always been somewhat equivocal, saying that, you know, Trump's big problem, that he was too confrontational with China, and we must have, find areas to work with it. This seems to be, a, a you know, and business would want this because um, big business, the big tech companies want ex access to the China market. We've seen the European Union, you know, put together a, a, a China investment uh, deal, uh, which gives China greater access to Europe than uh, Britain's uh, treaty <laughs> with China. Um, uh, so the, the policy on China is going to be crucial, I think, going forward. And how America um, reasserts itself in world politics, it, it, it is not very clear at the moment. And um, I think, you know, the, the, the debate going forward is, you know, if it's going to be further entangled in alliances, is that really going to serve America's uh, interests? Yeah, right. That's a good point to ponder for us international relations theorists. So my final thought um, 
I'm going to recommend this book. It was very thoughtful and made me um, gave me a lot of uh, frameworks in which to interpret our current political uh, changes. Um, so, Who Rules, edited by Roger Kimball. Final thoughts, David? No, I agree. I mean, it, it's it's you know a very um, important um, uh, book to be read, you know, by interested um, observers of our, our contemporary um, uh, confusion. Um, and it gives us a lot of insights to how we've arrived at, a, a, at our current um, crisis, really, in our democratic self-understanding. And it's important, you know, one of the prescriptions, obviously, I think, that comes through is that we've lost and we don't understand, it seems anymore, the notion of sovereignty um, and, and sovereign states being the necessary vehicles for maintaining a free democratic um, uh, West. Um, the loss of sovereignty and the assault on sovereignty, I think Kimball and others point out, is, 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 is um, uh, deeply concerning, I think, you know, and, and short, sort of undermines our, um, you know, when, when you get students saying, you know, what is sovereignty? Um, you can tell that um, nobody's read Thomas Hobbes anymore. Yeah. Well, thank you, David. Always a pleasure to talk to you. Until the next time. Very good. Bye -bye. Thank you.